Now, Mr. O'Brien, you are aware that the Royal Commission found that um, members of the organisation who no longer want to be subject to its rules and discipline have no alternative but to actively leave or disassociate from the organisation. Um, and that it found that the Jehovah's Witnesses' practice of shunning members who disassociate from the organisation potentially put survivors in the untenable position of having to choose between constant re-traumatisation and having to share a community with their abuser or losing their entire community. So those are two findings of the Case Study 29 report. You're aware of those findings? Um, yes, I'm aware of the findings, but I think we disagreed with the findings. But respectfully, I can say that. I think Mr Jackson, in his testimony, made the same point as I did in my testimony, that uh, we don't believe it's an impossible choice. Uh, a person can stop associating with Jehovah's Witnesses, um, have nothing more to do with Jehovah's Witnesses without taking the step of disassociation. We've well, tried to make that very clear. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm not going to go back down that path now, having exhausted Good. it on a previous occasion. But um, what I expect to find is uh, the organisation's response to these findings in your response document of 3 January 2017. Would that be right? That, that's where we should go to, is that right? That's correct, yes. yes. And so if we look at that document at tab 1, um, page 16... Um, which is ringtail 31. I'm um, right at the foot of the page, 7.14. Um, Our January document, is it? Do you have that? Just the January document? Yes. Yeah. 7.14. Um, so you say there in the first sentence, shunning a disfellowship child molester is and will continue to be Joe's Witness Bible-based response to this um, serious sin. Um, well, that depends, of course, on um, whether the person was disfellowshipped or reproved, doesn't it? If they were reproved, then they're not shunned. Yes, that's correct. But the, here it's talking about the... Dis the child molester, if oh, they are who is disfellowshipped, I beg your yeah. pardon, who is disfellowshipped. Yeah. But if they're not disfellowshipped, then they're not shunned. Right? No. Right, and then goes on, this practice is an effective mechanism for protecting children in the congregation. Well, of course, I think we canvassed before, that doesn't do anything for children outside the congregation. Would that be right? Well, that's a position to, that's been taken. But again, we say that the congregation arrangement is one to protect the congregation from sin. We judge the matter of sin. Uh, we're not in competition with the legal justice system. And I think we've been down the road a little earlier that uh, with reporting, we'll report that if it was mandatory reporting, that's a completely separate issue. If it's not, then we will leave that to the parent or the victim. But so it's certainly... So, Mr. Brown, that's the first of the three paragraphs response. If we go to the next one, 7.15, you say it is not and has never been Jehovah's Witnesses' policy to shun a victim of child sexual abuse. So that says what it says. That's, that's fine. That doesn't meet the point that's being made, which is the victim of child sexual abuse who wants to and does leave the organisation is shunned. And then 16... Um, says the policies and procedures on our elders should respond to victims have been consolidated and clarified. Elders have been reminded and encouraged to be empathetic and compassionate to the victims and their families. They've also been directed to provide ongoing shepherding to comfort both the victim and his or her family. The elders are approached by a survivor of child sexual abuse. They should speak consolingly to the person and manifest an empathetic, compassionate, patient and supportive response in exhorting congregation elders to lovingly and kindly serve as spiritual shepherds to victims of child sexual abuse, Jehovah's Witness confirm their long-standing policy that a victim will not be shunned. But and I suggest to you, none of that answers the point. The point being that it's particularly damaging uh, when a child sexual abuse victim leaves the organisation, disassociates from the organisation, and is then shunned. Well, that would 
be true if they disassociate themselves, you're referring to. Yes. Um, because that is the policy. But again, I think, as I, I pointed out in my evidence, I think Mr Jackson did as well, that here we're talking about somebody who is of an age where they have qualified for baptism. So they are somebody who's either approaching adulthood or an adult, making that decision, um, <coughs> understanding the implications of choosing either to disassociate themselves knowing the consequences will be shunning or simply um, ceasing activity with the congregation but not taking the stand of disassociation. So it's a choice on the part of the person. Well, in brief, what you're saying is you haven't changed, in response to the Royal Commission report in Case Study 29, you haven't changed anything in relation to shunning, is that right? Could I just read one scriptural point because not all of the commissioners were here for the hearing. and I. Thank you. This is really the, the basis for our thinking on, on these scriptural matters on which we find disagreement. So we appreciate there's disagreement. This is in the Bible book of Isaiah, chapter 33, and it talks about the laws under which Jehovah's Witnesses believe we come. Chapter 33, verse 22, it says, For Jehovah is our judge... Jehovah is our lawgiver, Jehovah is our king. So that covers every aspect of the legislative, the executive, the judicial process. All Jehovah God reserves to himself. And we understand scripturally he delegates some of that authority to congregations, to families, husbands, wives, parents. But ultimately, if God's word provides a direction on a certain doctrine, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses are bound by that, regardless of how others may view that. Well, I understand that's the position you take, and I'm not going to enter into a debate with you about how, as I did on the previous occasion, about how the Jehovah's Witnesses' position on a range of things has changed over the years on blood transfusions and blood um, fractions, by way of example and on a number of other things. So we'll leave all that to one side. But just to get back to my question, which I understand the answer is yes, and the question was, in response to the Royal Commission findings and recommendations in relation to shunning in the report for Case Study 29, you've not made any changes? Well, the branch committee or the directors of the Watchtower Bible and Track Society of Australia are not authorised to be able to do that, Mr Stewart. That, that was a matter Mr Jackson would have taken back to the governing body as he said he would. Yes, that's the point that, that you make, is you regard yourself bound by those policies or to those policies by the scriptures and you can't change them and therefore haven't changed them, is that right? Scriptural understanding, most definitely. Could yes. I comment, Mr Stewart? Yes, Mr Spinks. I think, and, and again, if it's about how it's presented, we, we accept that. We, it's not our intention to be defensive, but... <coughs> Council assisting is repeating uh, what was an incorrect conclusion from our perspective, and I say that with respect, where you're actually asking, have Jehovah's Witnesses changed something that they never did? So I think where the confusion comes in, and Mr O'Brien has nicely explained that if somebody chooses to take a different course and, and remove themselves disassociated, that's, that's a matter for them. But victims of child sexual abuse are not shunned. There's no Unless evidence... Unless they disassociate, then they are. That's the point. But, why, but again, you, what you're suggesting there is that the congregation makes a decision to shun a victim. If a victim or a survivor makes that decision themselves, then they understand the implications. There's not a situation where someone has disassociated because they're a victim of child sexual abuse. But we just wanted to make that point well, again. I think, I think the real issue is that for some people, the circumstances will be such that they just can't stay and they will find it necessary for their own survival, effectively, to disassociate. But the consequence of that is they are shunned and lose all of their prior 
social structure. That's that's the issue. And you heard the evidence that some people gave about that issue. That's the problem. If I could, Your Honour, with respect... That doesn't happen in other parts of society, generally. Again, Your Honour, with respect, and, and I certainly don't want to be uh, protesting a point... Say, that's, say what you believe to be true. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. The Commission has consistently, and we respect the right of the Commission to draw the conclusions and, and counsel assisting, uh, but the Commission has consistently failed to acknowledge that individuals who want to leave the organisation of Jehovah's Witnesses no longer be an active member can do that by conflating um, someone choosing to no longer be an active member and someone specifically disassociating themselves, saying, I just don't agree with the organisation anymore, I don't want to be a part of it, are two totally separate things. Uh, and again, with respect, we just make the point no, no, that... That was inherent in what I just put to you, but the consequence of dissociation, as we understand it, is that that person will be shunned, and that means they lose contact with family, friends, and everyone else who remains inside the Jehovah's Witness organisation. Is that wrong? Again, uh, Your Honour, the your, person... Your, your can... colleague is nodding. Is that yeah, right or not? Well, because you've said disassociated, yeah. uh, Your Honour, but he he or she can choose to be no longer an active member of the congregation. I understand that, but if they are so um, um, unable to cope with what's happened and the way they've been treated inside the organisation, that they dissociate, then they lose all of their previous social structure. Is that right? That could, that could be the case, and we respect their right to make that decision. Well, it's a pretty cruel way of dealing with someone, isn't it, who has suffered sexual abuse. I could only repeat what I've said, Your Honour. No, no, but it's cruel, isn't it? To take away, by reason of the rules that you impose, all of their social structure, that's cruel. I, could I just interrupt, Your Honour? I, I believe with the difference between disfellowshipping and disassociation, the congregation takes the action in disfellowshipping somebody who is then shunned. The person who disassociates himself, they, they are taking the action. Now... For whatever reason, I agree, and may, not even with regards to being a victim. Others make the same decision. But they are actually taking the stand to shun the congregation from themselves. That's, and they understand the implications of that. Now, it, it is, I agree, it puts them in a difficult situation, but it is a choice. You see, someone who comes to you and says, I was sexually abused, but because there's no two witnesses, they don't, you don't accept it. You don't make that finding. They're left in a very difficult position, aren't they? If they choose not to report it to the authorities, then... Well, for whatever reason, if the organisation doesn't acknowledge that they were abused, that imposes a great burden on them, doesn't it? I, if I could again respectfully say, Your Honour, we, we don't disbelieve a person who makes an accusation. That's why we investigate every accusation brought forth by the elders. Yes, but if there's not two witnesses, you don't accept it, do you? Because scripturally we're not I know. able to. I know. And that, you would understand, can be very, very distressing for someone who has come to you with that complaint, can't it? Certainly. Not being a victim is very distressing. Whatever consequences come, yeah, we agree. And that can lead to a chain of circumstances where that person feels unable to do other than dissociate <laughs> from your organisation. Could, could I respectfully, Your Honour, say we don't want to be defensive and we acknowledge that disassociation or disfellowshipping certainly have implications. Uh, an individual can choose to be inactive. Could I, could I use a very briefly a parallel uh, that in my careful reading of the, the issue papers from the Commission, and some of it I don't understand, most of it I have, it's been very well put together in the summaries. Uh, one reference said that uh, only reporting is low uh, across the community. Uh, one study that's whether, not suggesting the Commission validated it, but it, it was just referenced. Uh, one study in this country suggested that only 10% of child abuse allegations, uh, and I believe it was in New South Wales, but I'll be corrected on that, um, lead to a conviction, and only around half of those 
lead to a custodial sentence. I, I mention that simply to say that if on an occasion uh, a victim of child abuse has felt that um, where Jehovah's Witnesses have taken a Bible-based stand, my heart also goes out to the thousands of victims who've come forward and asked for help. It's not resulted in a conviction, or if it has, only half of those result in a custodial sentence. So I just put it in the context that we are extremely aware of the damage that is done where the victim it's compounded by the action that we, the police or the courts take. And in that context, we absolutely, absolutely agree with you. I understand what you say, but can I just ask you this simple question? Why is it necessary when someone feels that they can no longer abide the organisation and has to dissociate, why is it necessary to shun them? Why can't they keep having social contact with those people who happen to remain in the organisation? I'd say again, and I, we're going to appear very repetitive, I apologise, Your Honour, but the individual can choose. No, why is it necessary for the organisation to tell all of its adherents, you must shun that person? Because the individual has not taken the decision to no longer associate or to no longer be involved with congregation activities, which is their right. They've taken the decision to say... I'm shunning the congregation, I'm no longer a part of the congregation, I put it in writing. So the individual takes that action and we understand the implications. But when someone is disfellowshipped, the congregation takes that action. So the individual does not need to put themselves in a position where they're shunned. They can walk away, they can go to another congregation, that's their personal choice. But we understand and agree, and agree with the point you're making, Your Honour. Well, you haven't answered the point, but we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> the question is dispensing. You have not answered his honest question. His, answer is, his honest question is, why is it necessary to shun the person who disassociates? And before you answer, let me clarify one thing. The person who disassociates, both, both you and Mr. Brown have now said it, um, you said that they shun the organisation. They don't necessarily at all. They're talking about someone who just doesn't want to be part of it anymore. They still want to have their friends, their family, um, and and everything else, their social network. So I accept that kind of person, but it disassociates. Now, why is it necessary to have a policy that everyone else must now shun them? Again, that's a decision the person makes, no, because no, that individual... thinks that is not... Mr Stewart, I don't think we're going to get anywhere. I think we should... Well, the real answer to the question is because you say the Bible says so. That's the answer, isn't it? That, yes, that, that's how... Um, understanding of the scriptural yes. uh, disfellowshipping and disassociation doctrine. I should just say also that in relation to the point that uh, Mr O'Brien, you made, and Mr Spinks as well, I think, and that's that um, a person can become inactive without disassociating and, the, and in that way not be shunned. Now, without going through that evidence again, I just want to say to you that that's, that's highly contested by a lot of people um, as to whether that is possible. I know you say that's the case. A lot of other people say it isn't. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. But The po simple point is, and I'm not going to... I'll let you respond, but I'm not going to go down this path. We went down it before. Um, the simple point is this. A person who... Uh, does not want to be active in the organisation anymore um, in order to avoid being shunned, must disassociate. There isn't, there isn't a category of membership of inactive uh, and um, nevertheless welcome. Sorry, Mr. Stewart, that's... Well, I know you disagree, that's well, fine. When we've put it in print, I mean... We, the only point I'm making is that that's not accepted. Uh, again, we can apologise, Your Honour has said we're repeating the point, but it, it, we have a very clear understanding of the difference between someone being inactive, no longer an active member of the congregation, and someone who takes a decision to disassociate that clear to us, but we, yeah. we agree uh, to disagree. Going on to the question of redress, um, you don't actually have a policy.